Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Rachel. And I'm Andrew. And we are Picture the Scene Podcast, a true crime podcast aiming to put you, the listener, at the scene of the crime. We bring you a new episode on a weekly basis, mainly focusing on lesser known crimes from the UK and Ireland. However, at times we expand into cases from anywhere in the world and or ones that are well known. Well, mostly I do that because Andrew likes to keep it real with the lesser known ones. And I like to go down the rabbit hole and dive into the bigger cases. But it is a partnership that works. It is. As we are a true crime podcast, listener caution is advised. And today is no different. I'm covering a major case from nearly two years ago. A truly tragic case, but we'll get into that shortly. If you like what you hear, please do follow us on whatever social media platform you prefer, along with wherever you listen. And if you have the capability, why not give us a rating and review as well? It means so much to us and we love hearing from you. If you like us that much that you want to support us, you can also do so for the less than the um, for less than the cost of a medium Americano. And for those that don't love coffee as much as I do, a brew too on Patreon. We release bonus content every month and have plans for additional content too very soon. Exciting plans are in the pipeline, guys. Okay, so the links to our social medias and to Patreon can be found in the show notes. Or why don't you just visit patreon.com forward slash steampod. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash S-C-E-N-E-P-O-D. Okay, that's all of the terms and conditions over with today. Bravo. Great, excellent. Woo! Okay, have you been since our last episode, Andrew? Well, okay, actually, like sparkling, but my poor furry friend, my dog, got attacked by another dog at the weekend. No. Is yeah. he okay? He got bit on his back leg. He's fine, yeah. He's um he's actually in my bed now. Like oh, co- bless. covered up under the quill, but yeah, he's um he's fine, but did you have to take him to the vets? Well, no, because he it got bit, but he must have moved out of the way just before he could sink the teeth in because it, it broke the skin, but he didn't actually... Grazed. Oh, yeah, it gosh. didn't actually dig deep. What a um, time as well, obviously. There was that awful case in Surrey, wasn't there, of the mauling of the dog walker last week. Know. And, oh, that's heartbreaking, Andrew. Like, she was... Um, there were some riders on horses passing by and she was just screaming at them, run away, run away, whilst um, these, um, well, definitely one large dog. I'm not sure how many others were, were mauling her. Oh, heartbreaking. I didn't know that. I'm, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm no, hope, hope, uh, hope he's on the mend very soon and not feeling sorry for himself for too much longer. I gave him lots of treat and, uh, treats and I gave him some toast and he's happy enough, yeah. Oh, good. Well, dogs like toast too. Who knew? Dogs love toast. Oh, oh, that's a that's a really nice thing to say today. And I'm about to talk about a lot of not nice things. So it's like the the happy news of today's episode. Okay. Well, if it's safe for you to do so, I'd like you all to sit back, relax, and to picture the scene. Today, I'm taking you back to Wednesday, the third of March, 2021, to the city of London. Now, before I take you to the borough and talk about the weather and everything else about that day in March, I wanted to give everyone a quick recap of early 2021, the first two months to be precise. January 2021 saw UK schools close for the, f- for the start of the winter term. Remote learning continued for parents all over the UK. And with so many mixed messages coming from Downing Street, the police, medical professionals, teachers unions and everyone else in between, No one could see the light at the end of the tunnel on this COVID lockdown. However, a study from Imperial College London would later report that that mandated lockdown in January saw COVID-19 infections reduced by 80% in London alone. On to February 21, and the COVID vaccine programme was in full swing, with 24-hour vaccine hubs set up in parts of the UK, all elderly care home residents and those over the age of 65 being invited to book onto their first jab, and those aged between 16 and 64 and clinically vulnerable had been invited to book onto the programme too. However, lockdown didn't show any signs of easing, and schools and offices were likely to remain closed and restrictions in place until at least early March. New variants continued to spread, and by now, over 3.5 million people were reported to be shielding across the UK. 
And so by early March, whilst the vaccination was rolling out successfully and Pfizer was showing positive signs of helping reduce infections and symptoms of those with COVID, the virus remained very much on everyone's minds. And the majority of folks across the UK and the rest of the world continued to take precautions and follow rules diligently. Sarah Everard was no exception. So today we're starting the episode at around 9pm on Wednesday the 3rd of March in Clapham, South London. It's not a particularly warm evening, with temperatures settling at just 6 degrees Celsius. But then again it is early March, and major snowfall had caused massive disruption across the UK only weeks earlier. It's a cloudy evening but remains dry, and so 33-year-old Sarah Everard departs her friend's house on Luthwaite Road on the outskirts of Clapham Common just after 9pm for a two and a half mile walk to her flat in Brixton, a walk she was all too familiar with and one which should have only taken her 50 minutes to complete. Sarah, a marketing executive originally born in Surrey and raised in York, had been living in London for over 12 years and was very familiar with the city and how, as a young female, it was important to take certain precautions and be careful when walking around in the dark. However, on this evening, approximately 30 minutes or so after she leaves her friends on the outskirts of Clapham Common, Sarah was abducted. What happens next is beyond unbelievable, but I'm just going to put a pin in that for a couple of minutes as there's a few things I wanted to highlight. Now, as a female, I've always been told to never walk home alone and if absolutely needed to, to take a well-lit route. I'm told to tell friends or family where I'm going, the route I plan to take and what time I expect to be home. I'm told not to engage with strangers or raise awareness of myself as I walk. Keep my head down, no fancy technology out in sight. Definitely don't have earphones in. Be sure to be able to listen to any noises coming from around me. To wear bright and colourful clothes, try and wear sensible shoes in the event I need to pick up pace. And if I am alone, I should get on the phone with somebody and chat to them. That's to help keep me company, but also so that someone knows where I am and that I am alone. And finally, if needed, have something in my hand which can help in the event I am in danger. That might be keys between my fingers, a handbag ready to swing, or a whistle to attract attention. When I was visiting a friend at uni once, I was even told that I should be carrying pepper spray, which I found a bit excessive. But whatever it was to help make you feel safer. I have never in my life questioned or second-guessed any of this advice. I've abided by each of these simple rules, but perhaps not the pepper spray, still don't own any. And currently at the grand age of 37, I can confirm that I've never had the need to defend myself, nor have I been in a position where I've been frightened for my life. And now more than ever, I am so grateful for that. However, whilst it's great for me to sit here and tell you how lucky I am, I am presenting a true crime podcast episode about a woman who, at the time of the crime happened, was only two years younger than me who followed all of these rules, but she wasn't so lucky. And whilst we will go on to explain that what happened to Sarah and how that the events of that night were completely beyond her control, it makes me so angry that we as women are the ones who are told not to go out after dark. And if we do, be absolutely careful about where we walk and to be streetwise. And it just leads me to the term like victim blaming. It's just fucking cheeky and it's absurd and in my opinion it's completely unnecessary. And the only silver lining I can see during the Sarah Everard movement over social media was that for a brief moment it flipped everything on its head that we as women have been told. And what I mean by that is shortly after Sarah was abducted stories started flooding in on social media and women and men started talking about how it shouldn't just be a woman's responsibility to stay safe on the streets of London or anywhere else for that fact, and how men instead shouldn't perhaps go, you know, should perhaps go out of their way not to intimidate, harass, threaten, attack, rape or murder women, or generally just help women feel more safer. In the immediate aftermath of Sarah's disappearance, women in Clapham were told not to go out alone. Do you, as a man, understand how ridiculous that is? I do understand how ridiculous that is. However, um, just to add a caveat onto that, me as a man 15 years ago and more probably wouldn't have understood how ridiculous that was. So, yeah, it, it, it sounds stupid now and it sounds 
odd that we have to we have to educate people not to do things that they shouldn't be doing anyway. Absolutely. But um, but just putting my younger hat on, I probably was more naive and more ignorant to to some things. And um, and yeah, well, back in the past, I would probably would have been part of the problem rather than the solution. Um, and you you wouldn't be the only one even now, at the age you were back then, to be thinking that way. And it actually leads me nicely into like a point I just wanted to make about how about we flip this and start teaching boys and young men to help women feel safer. And, you know, something that came about from the awful um, case of Sarah Everard was that, you know, men can, when they notice a woman's walking on her own, they can do something to help in that situation. They can cross the other side of the road to help make her feel safer they can help make her feel less intimidated they can actually pivot and take a different route home you know and if if men don't want to do that well how about we in fact pose a curfew on all men not to be out walking the streets alone after a certain hour and and actually before you try and answer that i'll say no because that's absurd isn't it (laughs) however the precautions that women have to take should all be perfectly acceptable yeah i agree so, like, you'll be pleased to know, like, you know, that that was just a bit of a rant that's over now. And I'll get back to the case. But, uh, you know, for, for a brief moment back then in 2021, there really was this, like, positive movement. Um, and unfortunately, there have been many further cases since, um, you know, similar to Sarah. Women have been abducted, raped, murdered on the streets of London and in other places across the UK and the rest of the world as well. So, you know, we still have a massive problem here. But, you know, let's try and help reframe the problem and look at everyone's behaviour, not just women taking the precautions not to walk on the streets alone. Do you find that um, throughout society and throughout the ages, whatever is the flavour of the day in the media, so in this case the women's right to feel safe and not have to do things which men wouldn't have to do. And then it can also then be, say, like with George Floyd, with acts of racism or acts of homophobia or many things, it becomes flavour of the month in the media for a month or two. And so then the politicians get onto it and there's lots of nice sounding noises happen. But then it just moves on to something else and the problem never actually goes away and it's just like a huge cycle. So so yeah, yeah. nothing ever actually gets changed. There's no actual real policy or or shift in no, an, eff- and, an effort to make that change. And it's not all politicians and not all p- members of the police, you know, and not all like people that just are kind of tagging on to these movements. You know, there are some genuine people out there that are continuing to champion change of behavior change of law and change how we approach these problems but those one or two voices you're absolutely right they they get quietened because you know the press go and move on to something else that's like you say flavor of the month and and, you know that that cause gets left behind a bit yeah because it it needs those people at the grassroots who you mentioned but it also needs the media and the politicians to make sure it has an impact and change actually happens. Uh, so that's why, that's why I mentioned those because it needs a people in power and authority to actually make sure it happens rather than... Because if you're, say, um, a person who wants to make change and wants to wants to help make a difference, if you're a lone voice just singing into a, a wind blowing against you, you can do all the best you can do, but unless you have infinite amount of resources behind you, you're not going to really make a change, are you? You, you need mm. you need a you need a majority to get behind you, and the majority is influenced by media. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're going to take you back to the third of March now, and before I go into the details, the who, the what, and the where, I'm going to cover a brief timeline of events that um, kind of capture the 30-odd minutes in between Sarah waving goodbye to her friend and being abducted. As we've already mentioned, Sarah sets off from her friend's house on Luthwaite Road shortly after 9pm. Not long after, she calls and speaks with her boyfriend, 33-year-old marketing director, Josh Lowe. 
The pair stay on the phone for approximately 15 minutes as she continues her brisk walk home, and the conversation ends at around 9.28 as Sarah is walking along Cavendish Road. Sarah is last seen on a doorbell camera on Poinders Road, just over one and a half miles away from where she started off, and walking in the direction of Tulse Hill. Then she disappears. The following day, Sarah doesn't turn up for work, nor does she make contact with her friends or family, which is wildly out of character for her. Her boyfriend texts, her boyfriend's texts and calls go unread and unanswered, and by the early evening, he decides to visit her flat, but there's no answer at the door either. It is 8pm on Thursday the 4th of March that he then notifies police that Sarah is missing. But what's happened? She just didn't seem like the type of girl to pack up and run away. And when I was reading the victim impact statements, her sister made a comment about how there were unopened parcels on her doorstep um, waiting for her. There was sewing that she was in the middle of, you know, doing in a, a, on her living room uh, sofa. Uh, there, were, there was washing, hanging up, drying um, and, you know, parcels that were packaged up and ready to return to the shops as well. So, so many, like, tidbits of a life that you know she wouldn't have just randomly decided to walk away from now it's not uncommon for people to go missing in the uk in fact just under 200,000 cases of missing persons are reported in the uk alone each year but very few cases become as high profile as this one and sarah really captured the nation's attention the public response was huge within hours hashtag sarah everard had swept across social media platforms and I think I can speak on behalf of most of us out there when I say there was this unnerving feeling as soon as I read about the case. Sarah could have quite easily been any one of us or someone we knew, innocently walking home at 9pm that Wednesday evening. Within 48 hours of the police releasing details of missing Sarah, detectives had plenty of witnesses come forward with dash cam footage, including that of two buses and cars travelling on Poindon Road at the time of her abduction. The footage captured what appeared to be a young woman, matching Sarah's description, being arrested at the side of the road by what they assumed to be an undercover police officer, driving a white Vauxhall Astra, has its lights flashing. It didn't take long for police to track down the individual captured on the CCTV, and with the trail of evidence he kindly left behind him, they were able to secure an arrest warrant. On Tuesday the 9th of March, just six days after the last confirmed sighting of Sarah, PC Wayne Cousins of the Metropolitan Police was arrested at his home in Deal, Kent, on suspicion of kidnap. So who was Wayne Cousins? Well, let me take you back to September 2018, when the then 45-year-old made a transfer from Kent Police to the Metropolitan Police Service, initially forming part of their safer neighbourhood team. Irony. Oh, the irony. <laughs> Absolutely. Over the next couple of years, he moved around, eventually settling into a role in 2020, patrolling diplomatic premises, mainly embassies, for the Met Police. Only three weeks before Sarah's disappearance in February 21, Cousins, now aged 48, pulled up to the serving hatch of a McDonald's drive through in Swanley near Kent. He had his trousers pulled down and exposed himself to a female member of staff. She immediately reported the incident to police. Whilst he was under investigation internally as a result of this incident, Cousins remained free to rape and kill Sarah Everard only weeks later. It also transpired that back in 2015, there was another incident, at the time reported to Kent Police, of indecent exposure. But unfortunately, for some strange reason, this was not treated seriously, as he was able to pass through background checks and join the Met Police without issue only three years later. Great background checks there. I know. I know the only thing I can think of was that it wasn't like logged on his record. Yeah, but it should because I um I don't know this case that well. I, I tend to stay away from the well known cases, so I may ask some stupid questions here. But when you have in the UK, when you have um, a police check, there's uh, three different levels: basic, standard, and enhanced. Um, so basic just shows you unspent crimes. Enhanced, I believe I could get this wrong, so let me know if I'm wrong. And en enhanced is spent and unspent crimes. Um, so a standard is spent and unspent crimes, I believe. And enhanced is spent, unspent, and any notes, even if they are not 
relevant to an actual conviction. So you get to see everything on there. And a police, I assume applying for the police would be at the top level enhanced, the same as a teacher or any other um, profession where yeah. you come into contact with vulnerable people. So, so even if it wasn't, if they would have investigated it, there should have been some sort of notes against against this person on the account. So they should have flagged up. So if there was nothing there, then either the check wasn't done or there was never any proper investigation in the first place. Absolutely. Um, and I believe that any dealing with the police, such as like even a speeding fine, will reflect on your record enough to not be employed by the police services over a certain period of time so not quite under not quite sure how indecent exposure wouldn't like also fall within that remit if that makes sense but yes i i quite clearly think it's been something that's been reported you know maybe even a male matching his description but it's not been thoroughly investigated and never ended up on that report because you know either they couldn't be bothered or they just thought god that couldn't have been him move on i was reading about a crime today a totally different crime uh, for a potential future episode and the person didn't like how the police had dealt with him he was reporting a crime so he went to the police station and wanted to complain about the police officers and he couldn't because those police officers had never even created a record of the visit to him or anything like that. So it could be similar to that where they was that nonchalant and dismissing yeah. it, but they didn't even bother making a single like, auditable record of it. Anyway. Yeah. And before we get into this being like local Kent police and not something that the Met police, you know, on a much bigger scale would have to deal with. I didn't want to kind of touch on it much in this episode because it is all about the victim, but there were so many cases post the conviction of him. uh, um, There was so much fallout of um, behavior in the Met Police around Cousins and the case, you know, WhatsApp messages joking about um, him as um, a potential suspect, um, about his behavior, about lack of empathy to the victim. Uh, you know, and about talking about, you know, his, even his uh, interviews um, way before he pled guilty and it came to uh, sentencing. Just really naughty, irresponsible behaviour by people in the Metropolitan Police, which, you know, to a certain extent, when you're looking at local police authorities, you kind of think, you know, maybe some things are like slip under the radar, you know, local mentality, not really thinking bigger picture and all of that. But for some reason, I, I expect a lot more from you know the bigger kind of authorities in the in the metropolitan police. I'd say any. I was recently. You're probably not aware of this. There's been a police female police officer in, in the states, and we we record these a couple of weeks in advance, uh, guys. Now, so if you're thinking it's not recent anymore, we hear this, and she got fired because it turned out she slept with lots of other police officers while on and off duty. Um, and did various different sexual things. And so she got fired then. I mean, this is a small police force. There was only, I believe, 11 police officers in that town, and six of them got fired, her included. So it shows you what was going on. And that there's the internet's full of memes now about them making fun of her. And to me, it seems like it's going a little bit too far, but I think she's probably a candidate for self-harm. But putting that aside... One of the people responded a comment saying, why is everyone making such a big deal of this? In jobs everywhere, people sleep with their colleagues. And I think the point is, when you're in that type of profession, especially when you're on duty, you expect a higher level and a higher standard. More is expected of you. Yeah. Yeah. So so it's not just a fling. And she was married as well and everything. So I bet those guys guys get high five, though. She gets the memes, right, of being like, the you know how dare she promiscuous and all of that but those gentlemen get like oh you know good Actually, work school yeah it's it's all focused on her i'm not going to repeat yeah. any of them but it's all focused on mm-hmm. her yeah anyway, yeah so it's two to tango hey or six but yeah or six yeah okay okay how could the police be so sure about cousins being involved in the kidnapper sarah though 
Well, the evidence told a clear story of how calculated he had been in the planning of the abduction, rape and murder. Sarah was just the very unfortunate individual who was in the wrong place at the wrong time and played a part in his sick and twisted plan. On Sunday, 28th February, three days before Sarah's abduction, Cousins contacted a car hire firm in Dover to lease a white Vauxhall Astra, arranging pickup for the Wednesday afternoon. He used his own name and bank card for the car hire. He also purchased a large roll of self-adhesive carpet protector from Amazon, which was shipped to his home address. This would later be used to line the boot of his car so he could keep her body in there until he was ready to dispose of it. On Wednesday the 3rd of March, following his 12-hour shift patrolling the US Embassy, Cousins clocks off for a duty for for a five-day break. So because he's on night shifts, he'll be working a pattern and he's got following five days off. He heads to collect the car at approximately 5pm and at this point he calls to inform his wife because, oh yes, the prick is married that he'll be working another night shift and not to expect him home until the following morning to make arrangements for his children and their childcare. Later on that evening, at approximately 8pm, Cousins visited Tesco's on West Cromwell Road, Kensington, where he purchases a pack of 14 hairbands. Fifteen minutes later, he is captured on CCTV driving around the Earl's Court area before he makes his way south over Battersea Bridge towards Clapham. And shortly before 9pm, he heads back north to Earl's Court. And then, at 9.23, he heads back south once again over the Battersea Bridge. And by 9.30pm, he is captured on CCTV, driving through Clapham Common, emerging onto Poinders Road, where, if you recall, we last see Sarah. Initially, he denied any knowledge of or involvement in her disappearance. But when he realised they had probable cause to arrest and charge him for her kidnap, he quickly changed his story. Cousins suggested he was in financial shit. This is obviously captured from his statement. He suggested he was in financial shit and had been lent on by a gang from Bulgaria, Romania and Albania to pick up girls. He claimed that evening he was scouring London for someone suitable and when he landed upon Sarah, he kidnapped her and handed her over to the gang. He assured police that she was alive at the time he drove off. But in reality, Sarah was dead within five hours of meeting Cousins. We now know he stopped her along Poydens Road, where he presented his warrant card and staged a fake arrest. So why is this um, like such a silly, silly, um, silly story anyway? This is not Gangs of London or something, is it? But um, why would you think that's a better story to go with? Like, oh, it's, it's fine. I, I only did it because I was... I've, I've sold her into sex uh, trafficking and slavery. So, like, how is that like? What, what, what? How is that preferable than telling the truth? Yeah. Well, again, I kind of didn't go into it in the script because I didn't want to give his like crazy lies any airtime. But okay, sorry. basically, no, don't apologize. Basically, he kind of told the police in his interview that he wanted to protect his family from in in any like. Um, in any event, he would have, you know, if he was asked to do it again, he would have done it again. But he, he hopes that Sarah has come to no harm. And yeah, he's just kind of almost told himself this story um, in in the event he is captured. He's kind of told himself to the point that he really did believe it. Um, do you think people like him and in general, did you hear about it? I'm never quite sure if it's true. Do you think people can get to a point where they believe their own lies? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that when it takes a certain kind of person to do what he has done here, and I would liken what what he has done in the frame of mind that he has put himself in to prepare the length that he has prepared to go on and kidnap, rape, and murder Sarah. I'd liken that to people that abduct children. Um, might be a wild assumption that I've made out there, and you know, might cause or stir up a bit of um, conversation. But I truly believe that when they put themselves in these scenarios, they are satisfying their urges in the immediate moment. And then afterwards, they try and justify their actions. That's why they don't, you know, crumble, break down, go to the police or tell a loved one. 
They carry on behaving as they normally would. And I'll go on and talk about that in a bit. They carry on behaving in a normal situation because in their heads, they've justified it with a, oh, you know, I was doing it for, or, you know, I truly believe that, you know, I, I, if I, if I get caught, I'm going to tell the police. And you've, you've kind of run over that story in your head so many times that parts of it you believe. Not necessarily he believed the whole story because he knew it was fake. He knew she was dead. He killed her. But, yeah, that he's kind yeah. of invested in himself at that point. He's made it believable to himself, so he believes it will be to others, I guess. Yeah. And, and he it... kind of, you know, maybe even at the time when he's, you know, in, in the moments, he's kind of justifying it in his head. This is premeditation, though, as well. Like oh, a, a lot of lot of crimes, such as you mentioned with children, where they are despicable, a lot of them are opportunistic. I can't say that word, aren't they? But opportunistic, is, yeah. And as in, they, they and, like, like the, the the predator will see a moment where it's prime condition, then they can they can act on it. But he like. Rented a car in advance, ordered stuff from Amazon in advance. So, and he, he lined it up to be when he had his five days off. So, this is not an opportun- opportunist, I can't say the word crime. This yeah. is, um, this is pure premeditated, isn't it? I, yeah, it I, t- I totally see your point. And I feel like, yeah, although he had not identified Sarah as his victim in advance. He had absolutely lined everything else up for that evening to be capturing a woman to commit yeah. that crime. Um, and yeah, absolutely, you know, criminals do take opportunistic times to abduct children, but there's a there's also a level of them, the way cousins was, wanting to satisfy their urges and knowing that it's kind of bubbling up. Um, yeah. and that's that's what I liken it to, not necessarily the no, I get the, you. The moments that lead up with the cling film and, you know, everything else that he had kind of purchased and, and lined up ready. I get you. I'm interested. I, I really don't know this story that well, so I'm also interested as to why he wanted hair bands. But I'm sure you're going to get onto that. I'm not, actually, Andrew. Um, he, ha- a, he had no speculation. hair. Did he? He had no, no hair? No? Okay. No, no hair. There's been speculation that, like, you know, could have used it to... Yeah, tie tie her up. He obviously had handcuffs because he's a police officer. Um, but yeah, the the hair bands has never really been like, and he's never admitted to why that purchase is made. It's probably good that we don't know. I don't think it'd be anything pleasant. No, you're right. Sarah was compliant and sat down on the pavement to be handcuffed. He then drove her over eighty miles to Dover, where he transferred her to his own vehicle and is to be believed to have raped and strangled her with his police belt. And the fear, imagine the fear, because after a mile or two, she would have known that this wasn't right. And it doesn't matter what he says, because obviously he was probably still trying to pl- placate her, so he kept her quiet in the car, but you would know then, and the fear would just get worse and worse. And then by the time you get to the destination to swap cars, oh, I really can't imagine... And I think, I, I, I guess that's a problem as well. I can't imagine the fear a woman would like that, a woman would feel in that situation. And I guess that's a problem why it's hard to get change happen because it's hard for men to put themselves in the shoes of vulnerable people, including women. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And bearing in mind, Cousins on that drive, he, so he's not captured stopping anywhere on that 80 mile drive. So she has entered that car without a gag. In yeah. her mouth, right? So she is able to ask him questions along the way, speak, chat, you know, talk. And as you suggest, one mile, two miles, three miles into that journey, that increasing level of concern for her own welfare and what, what, where are we going? Why are we leaving London? Why are we on the motorway? You know, and trying to put yourself in those shoes as a woman or a man yeah incredibly difficult um and something that i'll chat about a bit later just doesn't sit easy but uh you're right no one could have um could could imagine what uh what level um she's kind of rising to as that's as that's happening 
as, as he continues on that journey. On the 5th of March, two days later, Cousins is captured on CCTV purchasing petrol from a local BP garage and also purchasing green builder's bags from B&Q. Over the course of the next few days, he burns her body and dumps her remains in those B&Q bags into a woodland pond just metres away from land he owned. All these movements are captured on CCTV and can be found on YouTube. And to be honest, with the level of CCTV that's available and out there in the public domain, I'm honestly not sure what he thought he'd get away with given he worked for the police. I mean, I would imagine the way that you and I go through training for work about instances of you know, things to identify when it comes to like, you know, precautions that we need to take as a business and all of that good stuff, right? I am very confident the police go through training of, you know, in the event you are involved in a crime, there are X amount of cameras capturing movements in London alone. Like, he must have had some sort of awareness of how often you are captured on roads and on streets and all of that both as cars as pe- and as people he must have had some sort of knowledge of that. he must have done but you think about any type of serious criminal you it would get to any type of crime where you would think how could any human do this and this is one of those crimes how could any human do this the fact that we don't know how a human could do this is because we can't we couldn't do it ourselves but like if it doesn't matter what profession you're in, it probably just took him longer for the desires to become stronger than the fear of getting caught. That's all it was, and that's all it was. And maybe the incidents of um, exposure and whatnot beforehand was just his desires trying to get out in a less serious manner. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah no, it makes sense, but. Just that story that he originally had around handing off to a gang, how he then tracks it, covers his tracks in terms of randomly purchasing a canister of petrol. And yeah, no, maybe it's just like when you've got the, I don't know, maybe he just was arrogant. I don't know, I don't know the, the mm. guy's personality, but maybe he was arrogant or just assumed. He was more intelligent than a lot of, a lot of people down for when they assume they're more intelligent than the people. Who yeah, could, and I guess who, I guess only minutes ago we were talking about him getting so wrapped up in his own web of lies, weren't we? So you know, he too could have been in that moment forgetting, blocking out the actions that he took in the days following the events because he's kind of like spun this story that he now is fully invested in. In the immediate aftermath of the murder, Cousins is captured on CCTV at a petrol station purchasing water and Lucas Aid. This is at around 2.30 a.m. Two drinks? And once... Yeah, two So drinks. was she still alive and was one for her? No. The expectation at that stage is that he has killed her at that point. Okay. But it obviously is. So he's come off a night shift. He's not gone back home and not slept. He stayed out all night and kind of rolled into another night shift, hasn't he? So I think because I too thought about that and I thought Lucas is just one of those drinks you get when, unless you're kind of a Red Bull person, Lucas is kind of go to, isn't it, for energy? Sure, I guess it would have been going off the high and the adrenaline of what he did. And when that started to die off, then yeah, the, the Lucas A to keep him awake and alert, yeah. Yeah. And he's then captured once again at Costa Coffee at 8.15am on the 4th of March. This time he stops for a hot chocolate and a Bakewell tart. Now, how callous can someone be? Yeah, that's just... On this shop CCTV, all all that is seen of him is him fidgeting with his fingers. But that being said... Put that into context. If you're like in a coffee shop, eight fifteen in the morning, and you want your sugar fix, you want your caffeine fix. I know he's getting a hot chocolate. You know, that's not abnormal behaviour. He's just you know fished him with his fingers a bit like a bit like that. That's all. And then shortly after that, he makes a call to the vet to get medication for his dog. And then at some stage, heads back to his wife and children at home. You see, even if I was single and alone and had no friends, I couldn't do something like this 
if I had a dog, because I'd be thinking what would happen to the dog. Um, I know yeah, I'm, not, I I'm not trying to make light of it there. Sure no, enough. no, no, you're not. But I think as well, like, he is not thinking about anybody else but himself, is he? No, you're right. And, like, he's dabbled with the law. He's gotten away with those other cases of indecent exposure. He's probably under the impression at this stage he's going to get away with this. Actually, those other cases would have reinforced his bit belief probably that he could get away with it he's because, untouchable because if you think about a standard citizen if, if they if they refer as proof that you had committed indecent exposure nowadays maybe 10 20 years ago yes but not even 10 years ago 20 years ago yes but nowadays you wouldn't get away with it there would be an actual charge even if it's just a caution because a caution would can still lead to a um, a place on the sex offenders register for two years or a um, yep. prevention order. So there'd be something so they could still be monitored. So maybe that added to his belief, oh, I can't get caught, I won't get caught. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think Bethan on Seeing Red a couple of weeks ago made a comment about... Um, individuals who are known to expose themselves you know the likelihood of them going on to commit more serious crimes is is captured and tracked from what we know of all the criminals and their past behaviors so if you've got a police officer who has watched those cases happen i'm not saying all cases that that is the pattern if you have a police officer who has watched that pattern happen and he's not been captured yet, he absolutely would be potentially Billy Big Bollocks, wouldn't he? And yeah. be like... Do we know if he was a drug user of any type? Just, um, I'm, if I'm completely honest, I'm not, not sure. Nothing that I read alluded to him using drugs. The reason I ask is I was just thinking... The behaviour you describe in the uh, coffee shop, where he's wringing his hands, and that I don't, you could associate that. You could associate with yeah, either anxiousness or slight withdrawal symptoms, or um, anxiety and fear of getting caught, mm-hmm. or just he needed a caffeine here because he was tired. So it could mean absolutely nothing. But it, it well, he didn't actually him. have any caffeine. He had hot chocolates. What but when he, he was when he was um in when he was being interviewed at his home and there was a special request where he was allowed to be interviewed in his home without being taken to the station because at that time they thought Sarah was still alive and they needed to get information as quickly as possible to officers his knees were shaking his knees were bouncing but they put that down to a level of anxiety because he was being you know um uh he was being cornered in on what's this what's the term cornered, he's been backed right? into a corner yeah, yeah. He, so yeah maybe it's closing just... in on him so speaking of which in the days running up to his arrest and like i think that this this paints a real picture of how this man behaved after he had um raped or kidnapped raped and murdered sarah he actually took his family to the woodland um on a day trip um, just for a day out over that weekend, you know, just to have a bit of fun, go and explore. And I just think, like, we hear about killers returning to the scene of the crime. And, you know, there might have been an element of his curiosity wanting to know had the bags been discovered. Certainly by this point, her name would have been out there. We know on, on Friday the 5th that, you know, she was in the press. The, the social media movement was sweeping across the nation uh, you know, was there an element of curiosity or was he getting some sort of additional kick out of being in, in the place where he'd committed such a horrible, awful crime, safe in the knowledge at that point that no one was any the wiser? Crazy. So he took his kids to where he dumped her body? Yeah, not the exact, like, oh, pond, yeah, but, but the local, uh, to his land that was just metres away. Um, and I, I don't know whether, you know, how far on that boundary they visited, but yeah, he took them to the area. And they don't actually know exactly where he parked his car and did the deed and, you know, then killed her. They don't know where he burnt her. Like all of that. And, and there's general areas that were reported to police, you know, with the fire and 
all, all sorts like that. But you don't know where he took them that day, how yeah. close he was in proximity. But the, even to the general area, it just sends shivers down my spine about like how, I don't know, you know, brave he must have been feeling. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. By the 8th of June, Cousins had admitted to her rape and kidnap. And finally, on the 9th of July, 2021, just four months after his arrest, Cousins finally pled guilty to Sarah's murder, saving the family a trial. The two-day sentencing hearing at the Old Bailey on the 29th of September, 2021, confirmed exactly what many had feared. Only six minutes after she had finished that call with her boyfriend, the off-duty Metropolitan Police officer had her in handcuffs. Sarah had followed all the rules we laid out earlier. As a 33-year-old lone woman walking through the streets of London that Wednesday evening, she followed well-lit paths, stayed on main roads, wore bright-coloured clothes to be seen in the dark, made contact with her boyfriend, told her friends the route she'd be walking home. And when told she had been breaking COVID lockdown rules, she surrendered herself willingly to cousins. Can I ask you a question as a as a woman, Rachel? Yeah. Uh, I know you said at the beginning, you do all these things and it's silly like women have to do this just to be safe. And, and she did all these things. So she told her friends and that. Yeah. How common is it that, I mean, it's sad that she, anyone has to do this anyway and it still didn't keep it safe. But how common is it that women have to say like, I'm going here and this is when I'll be home. Is that just, is it common? Every time this? you go out, on your own and whether that's going out leaving a place or going out to visit a place going away on holiday on your own anytime it is it is natural habit for me to tell somebody this is where i'm going well do you know what i think i'm thinking now my wife always messages me saying i'm leaving here now i'll be there this is where yeah. i'm going and i'll be there at this time i'll be home at this time and no, so, I, I, so I think you're right. And even like my wife's going away for a few weeks soon. And I'm thinking about it. You're right, because she wanted to go and spend a couple of days at a beach. And I my initial reaction was, I don't want you to because you're going to be alone. And I don't know if you're going to be safe or not. And it's it's that where even in my head as a, as a man, I was thinking, don't go to a tourist location because you might not be safe because you'll be alone and you shouldn't really have to you shouldn't really have to do that should you You shouldn't have to prevent or stop part of your life just because of other people so yeah it's it's, it got me thinking then when i asked that question yeah it's it's just normal now i when i get that message i don't really think about it but yeah you shouldn't really have to do that should you i never do that one i was go i never go like i'm going here and i'll be home at this time and stuff yeah. Yeah. No. And I uh, just to give you a live example of this, like if my other half leaves the house and to go late at night to uh, five side, or maybe somewhere else to drop something off or whatever, I would I would find it weird if he texted me when he got there. Yeah. However, roll reverse. I'm gonna go to hockey training, or you know, I'm gonna go for night out with the girls or something something very normal that I would do on a weekly or monthly basis I will text when I get there I'll text whilst I'm there tell him where I am and I'll text before I leave and that's not because he needs to know where I am it's more for my kind of record of events and safety and likewise like if I am if I am walking alone I will either pick up my phone and pretend to be on a call if my friend or family member is not answering at that point, or I will be very aware of what is around me and I will keep my senses heightened for that whole time that I'm walking alone wherever I am. It is just normal. It would it would be abnormal not to feel that way. You're right. You're right. I'm trying to think. These things are just automatic, aren't they? But I do believe that if on a rare occasion I don't get something, a message I often send is, are you okay? So I'm just, cause I'm so used to getting that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's crazy. I've got a question for you, but I'll save it to the end because I think it's an okay. end-up end pod question. Remind okay. me. 
Sarah likely made the decision that fateful night not to use public transport like the bus or tube or even take a taxi home due to the restrictions that were in place during the UK's lockdown. And even so, if the lockdown hadn't been in place, Sarah was a very active person. And I'm pretty sure that because it was early on in the evening, she wouldn't have thought anything of walking home early to walk off a little bit of the food and wine that she had consumed with her friend earlier that evening being safe in the knowledge that she'd probably have a clear head in work the next day because it was a school night. And to your point earlier, Andrew, I can't help but think about the moments in which Sarah realised this wasn't a normal arrest and that she wasn't safe. He drove her, hands cuffed behind her back, with a seatbelt on, leaving her in a completely powerless position for over 80 miles to Kent. And at some point in that journey, it must have dawned on her what was happening. And therefore, she likely spent her final hours in absolute fear at the hands of a man who had zero empathy for other humans. And 80 miles in City and Motorway, that's what, about an hour and a half, would you say? Roughly? Yes, yeah, about 90 minutes in the car. Watching as, you know, she's taken further and further away from London. And as I say, like earlier, she's not got anything restricting her from using her voice, from screaming, from, you know, anything. Like, saying to him, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? It's just... A part of it would be as well, the more scared she got, probably the more hopeful she got that she was wrong. And it was genuine, so she would have tried to probably be more compliant. Or even when she got to the stage where she thought, this is not, then you'd think you'd probably try and be compliant for your own personal um, survival, wouldn't you? Not to annoy. Yeah, there's that. But then there's also, I would imagine from reading all of the articles on what kind of human being Sarah was, she'd have felt probably, and I'm massively putting words in her mouth here because she's not here to tell her story. And I've not read this coming directly from anyone, but she'd have probably felt stupid for putting herself in that situation because she was streetwise and extremely savvy and she wouldn't have just gotten some random stranger's car. And that became quite apparent in the early days when it was claimed that somebody abducted her off the streets in a car, which was accurate, but at the time it wasn't disclosed that he was disclosed. He was a, an off-duty policeman. Um, people would just say, no, she wouldn't. She wouldn't have gotten his car. That's ridiculous. So I'm pretty sure that there would have been an element of I've let my family down you know what have I done why did I do it why didn't I run why didn't I scream you know all of those things because again I don't want to harp on about it because there's probably men listening out there that like shut up um but again you know as a woman when you are on your own you play through scenarios in your head what am I going to do if this happens what should I do if that happens okay worst case scenario where are my exits where can I go uh, where's my phone? How quickly can I call someone? You know, you do, you play those scenarios out. And I've no doubt that she had all the time to be thinking about, you know, how she could play this scenario out. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I mean, firstly, if there's any, uh, I don't know if chauvinist is the right word, but if there's any men out there thinking, God, will this woman shut up? Then I've said it in the past, feel free just to turn us off and go and listen to someone else instead um but even that question like you're right she probably wouldn't be thinking how could i be so stupid but it's not stupidity is it because yeah. she's done what she's been conditioning life to do which is during resp- lockdown yeah which is respect and even if it wasn't in lockdown this guy had an official police badge you put her in handcuffs she would have probably complied anyway. Like 99.99% of people would. Because you talk to comply to even if you think this is a total mistake, you'd go we'll along with it. The place yeah, you go along with it to a point, yeah. So No, that's a really good point. But I, I think just lockdown added and this is why I wanted to kind of cover the early stages of twenty twenty one at the at the top of the episode, because there was this really weird air of what the fuck are we meant to do? Um I don't know whether you remember it, but it was at the time that kind of Boris was losing his mind as well. Kind of, you can go out, but don't go out. And you can yeah. use a tube, but don't use a tube. And we want you to be safe, but, you know, we 
we don't want you to feel like locked in at home but also don't leave the house and you know it 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 was a really confusing time for everyone so you know just kind of wanted to emphasize there that well she, you know I think she may have felt stupid because that's the place where we all go um it absolutely wouldn't have been at all um anything that you know you wouldn't if you if you were compliant with the law like you say that you wouldn't have second guessed at the time you'd have just thought gosh you know yeah like you say we'll clear this up when we get to the station absolute yeah. error my my apologies you know I'm embarrassed more than anything exactly yeah Okay, so on the 30th of September, Lord Justice Fulford sentenced Wayne Cousins to a whole life tariff, which, just for the benefit of listeners that aren't aware, that means there is no possibility of parole. With the judge telling the 48-year-old the seriousness of the case was so exceptionally high that it warranted a whole life order. Cousins actually appealed his sentencing a month later on the 27th of October, However, I'm pleased to tell you that it was rejected in July 2022 and Cousins remains only one of 59 killers in the UK to spend their entire life behind bars. The family impact statements are a tough read and I mean it when I say Sarah was a little bit of all of us or at least someone we all knew. I'm just going to wrap up today's episode with an extract of her sister, Katie Everard's impact statement. How dare you take her from me? Take away her hopes and her dreams, her life, children that will never be born, generations that will never exist. Her future no longer exists. The future I was supposed to live with my sister no longer exists. You have ruined so many lives. Sarah is the very best person with so many people who love and cherish her. I want to speak to her and hug her and hear her laugh and go out for dinner and drinks and dancing. All those conversations we can never have. There were so many things I wanted to share with her. Trips abroad, being each other's bridesmaid, meeting her babies and being an auntie, growing old together and seeing who got the most wrinkles. We weren't even halfway through our journey and you took it all away. I feel like I live in a make-believe world, as if nothing is real. I have to pretend because the thought of not having Sarah forever is too hard to bear. A lifetime now seems a very long time. I should never have to write a eulogy for or bury my little sister. There is no punishment that could res- that could receive that will ever compare to the pain you have caused us. We can never get Sarah back. The last moments of Sarah's life play on my mind constantly. I'm so disgusted and appalled. It terrifies me that you have such disregard for a person's life. You were taken from me the most precious person, and I can never get her back. This has been season two, episode 14, titled Text Me When You Get Home. And so for one last time, if it's safe for you to do so, I'd like you all to relax, to close your eyes and picture the scene. You've had a great time catching up with your pal and it's time for her to head home. You say your goodbyes at the door and you mutter the words, text me when you get home. You think nothing more of it, You lock the door behind you, you switch the lights off and you make your way to bed. Just to be left thinking only days later, was there anything more you could have done? Well, Rachel, um, that was, um, I didn't really know that story as I've probably said too many times now, but um, it was good to get the, the actual details. I tend to stay away as well from listening to stories that are well known because so it's just personal preference, but sometimes it's good when I do because you actually realise that it's important to listen. And that last bit that you said there, I was thinking then when you said, if it's safe you to do so, one of the things which it should have been safe for Sarah to do so, to walk home in a city that is one of the largest cities in the world, which is blanket CCTV coverage everywhere. Um that should be safe for people to do so. And it's a sad indictment of our society that that is not. And think about, even when we covered Lily in a previous episode, you remember she had, and it's still up there, you go to uh, uh, Instagram, she had 
posts about this on there. And she was still raped and killed afterwards. So it goes to show that it doesn't, it's not going away. And it's just, um, it's always, I think for a lot of people, it's always, well, that doesn't happen to me or people I know, or Mm -hmm. the woman must have done something wrong. The victim must have done something wrong. Because if she would have been sensible, if they'd have been sensible, or not done this or that, then it wouldn't have happened. And that's just victim blaming, isn't it? It should be, the, the question should be, why, when, it's hard to fathom when there's no warning signs from someone, and when there's no, when someone does something so serious, yet there's absolutely nothing what to like prelude that. So you can't say, maybe we could have thought about this. But there was warning signs with this guy. And there was warning signs in a profession where your employers are supposed to spot these warning signs. So we use the word preventable quite a lot, but this was preventable, not from things Sarah should have done, but it's preventable from things Metropolitan Police should have yeah. done. Yeah. I know. I... And the police that we all know and trust. And I think it's a really poignant um point that you've made around she absolutely should have been safe to walk home everyone should be safe to walk home without putting all these measures in place but she had put those measures in place as well and yet again I know that there's been a well covered case by numerous pods but I felt passionate about doing my own research and looking into you know that what happened that night and I think it's it's good to you know, for me to be talking about something that I really do feel so passionate about in a case that really did capture me um, and and how, you know, I, I feel about safety for everyone on the streets or in their home or, you know, basically things that we most of us take for, for granted. Oh, definitely. Um, and we, we said it at the beginning as well, you have to if you don't keep these things in the public eye and talk about them, the things can't change. So there's that, so there's nothing wrong with covering the case. And um, three quarters of our listeners are actually not from the UK. So, so they may never have even known who Sarah Everard was. So um, there's nothing wrong with covering any type of case. Um, I'd just like to say also... When you was talking, it got me thinking about, I've just finished a book. I listened to on audio, but it's the same if, it, if it's written. A book called Inside Job by Dr. Rebecca Myers. I didn't plan on doing an advertisement for it. She mm-hmm. is a psychiatrist who works in, oh, sorry, a psychologist, not a psychiatrist, who works in prisons. And she started uh, delivering the first sex offender treatment programs in prisons. And she... She talks about when they first started, some of her first groups, which had like people who had raped several women, raped and killed women, and uh, like abused children. And what's really interesting is she describes how these men justified it to themselves and also how they described the crimes. Not as in like the details in what actually happened, but like a guy who killed his neighbor because he was a virgin and he was a police officer actually. And um, he thought that he would, um, he just wanted a date and he just wanted a woman to be his girlfriend, but he couldn't see that it was wrong to, he went to a house with a shotgun and then he forced her to go for a picnic with him. And then he, um, and then he shot a man and a dog who interrupted him raping a woman, and then he killed a woman. And even it wasn't until after he had been in prison and started a program that he realised that it was wrong. Right. Okay. So he'd never been taught. Yeah, it's just like his his thinking. Even though as a police officer, his thinking was. 
well, she agreed to come with me. She was compliant, so it wasn't against her will. And she agreed to have in his word sex with me, even though he raped her. So I didn't rape her because she said yes. And then it was the other man's fault for interrupting us. And that's when it all escalated. So that type of thing. But it's just fascinating how, because she also describes her emotions and having to deal with these type of people and stuff. And it's just fascinating how um, it gets you into the minds a little bit. I wasn't going to advertise this, but just because it, he will be going through this. Well, maybe not actually, because he's never going to be released. And these are things to help help gear towards release. But um, but he, yeah, maybe it just helps give a little bit of an insight. But um, there's so many cases of police men and women abusing their powers. And not just, you know, when it comes to rape and murder, but other other crimes as well. And I think that, like, if that, obviously, her being, did you say a psychologist? Yeah, I think you yes. corrected yourself and said yeah. a psychologist. Like, there's obviously a level where she will empathise and, and understand that his behaviour definitely led him down that path of not being any the wiser of what was appropriate and inappropriate. But there are other people that play on that, unfortunately, in society. So you can't even say... That like, you know, Wayne Cousins, for instance, was like psychologically damaged and felt that that was normal behavior to be around women. And because for so many years, I mean, well, for 48 years of his life, he he was a member of society, clever enough to pass exams, get into the police, hide his crimes, you know, get married, have two children. And then exactly. reach the grand old age of 48 and not be able to to squash his urges. Exactly, exactly. Um, thank you for covering that, Rachel. I'm glad you did. Rachel didn't tell me what she was covering, and she did imply to me last night that I may not be happy with the subject that she chose, probably because I go for the lesser crimes, but it's only because that's what interests me the most. But no, I'm I'm, I'm glad you do. You had a bit of insight into, into my head, so that always thanks. helps. Thanks. Good, good. Okay, thanks for today. Um, that was really... Um, yeah, a case that uh, not pleasant at all, but um, always good to get out there and educate people on and, and talk about and keep Sarah's name alive. Yes, and thank you, Rachel, and thank you, everyone out there. Please do, um, please do subscribe to us if you can on your podcast player. Bye. Bye. Bye.